Uh, we are honored today to welcome our uh, grand, uh, grand round speaker, Dr. William O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien is the Chief of Neuroradiology and Director of Pediatric Neuroradiology Fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. He's also Associate Professor of Clinical Radiology at University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Dr. O'Brien received a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and at attended medical school at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. He completed a radiology residency at David Grant a Medical Center at Travis Air Base, California, and fellowships in neuroradiology and pediatric neuroradiology at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, during his military ca career, Dr. O'Brien served in a variety of academic roles to include department chair and radiology residency program director. Uh, he joined the faculty at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in 2017 as the director of Pediatric Neuroradiology Fellowship Program. We are really honored to have Dr. O'Brien here. Um, I met Dr. O'Brien during my residency. Uh, at Cincinnati, and uh, he, he, had, he was already renowned, and he was writing big books in radiology, which everyone around the world was reading to give exams, and uh, we were attributing our success in our boards to the books uh, which he wrote. So um, I know him from that time, and he was already famous at that time. Um, so re I'm really honored to have you here, and the topic today is uh, paranasal sinus imaging. No, thank you for mu so much for that introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Um, I'm just thrilled to have the chance to talk about something that is one of my favorite topics, which is imaging the paranasal sinuses. So we'll go ahead and get started. I don't have any disclosures. And then looking at the lecture outline, we're gonna start off looking at normal sinus anatomy. Then we're gonna look at some sinus development and variants to include normal variants as well as pathologic variants. Then we're going to focus on the dominant paranasal sinus drainage patterns and different types of inflammatory sinus disease, look at complications of paranasal sinus disease, and at the end we'll wrap it up with looking at uh, critical anatomic variants that you want to identify on the preoperative sinus CT to help keep the uh, surgeon and patient out of trouble when they go in there for functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So in terms of the normal anatomy, the paranasal sinuses consist of paired frontal, ethmoid, maxillary, and sphenoid sinuses, and they're bordered by the orbits, the nose, the facial bones, and the cranial vault. So now we'll go through and we'll look at each sinus. So in terms of the frontal sinus, both its roof and its posterior wall separate the sinus from the anterior cranial fossa, and the floor of the frontal sinus is uh, the orbital roof. Looking at the maxillary sinus, its roof is the floor of the orbit. Its floor is the maxilla along the hard palate. Its posterior wall separates the maxillary sinus from the pterygopalatine fossa. And then its medial wall is the same wall as the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Looking at the ethmoid sinus, the roof is the fovea ethmoidalis, and that'll become important when we talk about the preoperative sinus CT. Its posterior wall shares the anterior wall with the sphenoid sinus, and then its lateral wall is the lamina papricia or the medial orbital wall. And then lastly, the sphenoid sinus, its roof is either the floor of the anterior cranial fossa or the margins of the cella, depending upon the degree of pneumatization that the uh, sphenoid sinus has. The floor is the roof of the nasopharynx and portions of the posterior nasal cavity. Its posterior wall is the clivus, and like we talked about, the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus shares the posterior wall with the ethmoid sinus. Now, in terms of sinus development, it occurs in a predictable sequential pattern. So at birth, children are gonna have rudimentary maxillary and ethmoid sinuses, and then that pneumatization and development will progress over the next few years of life. The sphenoid sinus usually starts to develop at about two to three years of age, and the frontal sinus is the last to develop. That's usually about four to eight years of age. And there's lots of variation in terms of development of the paranasal sinuses, especially when it comes uh, into play with the degree of pneumatization. But the important thing in a young child is that you don't want to mistake normal development for pathologic inflammatory sinus disease. So here's an illustrative case of a normal sinus appearance of a 16-month-old girl on MRI and you can see at this point, you have rudimentary development of the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses. 
sphenoid sinus has not yet pneumatized, which you wouldn't ex expect to start till about two to three years of age. And going back to that maxillary sinus, it's important to recognize that laterally, this is normal marrow. So this is portions of the maxillary bone that have not yet pneumatized to form the sinus. You don't want to mistake this for inflammatory sinus disease. So in terms of pneumatization, most often you're going to have excessive or extensive pneumatization. It can infect any one of the paranasal sinuses, but typically involves the sphenoid sinus, or at least most commonly. So here are some examples of excessive pneumatization that we commonly see. Here you see inferior extension of pneumatization going into the uh, body of the pterygoid. And then here you can see excessive pneumatization going superiorly and laterally into the anterior clinoid. And this becomes important because when you have excessive pneumatization going into the anterior clinoid, you can get uncovering of the optic nerve as it traverses the sphenoid sinus. Here's an example of excessive pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus going inferiorly and posteriorly. And in this case, you actually have a thin bony margin of the uh, uh, clivus, and that's going to be important when we talk about the preoperative sinus CT. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum is underdevelopment or a hypoplastic sinus. By far, the most common is going to be the frontal sinus, and this really is an incidental finding. It does not have any clinical consequence. So here you can see an example where you have normal pneumatization on the right and lack of development of the frontal sinus on the left. Prior to four years of age, you don't expect it to pneumatize, so that's normal development for age. But once you get beyond the eight, nine, 10 year, uh, if you don't have development, then it's usually a hypoplastic frontal sinus. The next most common underdeveloped sinus is gonna be the maxillary sinus, and this occurs in about 10% of patients. And when you're looking for the degree of pneumatization, Typically, pneumatization extends inferiorly to the level of the hard palate in the region of the base of the dentition. Now, unlike frontal sinus hypoplasia, maxillary sinus hypoplasia in a small percentage of patients can be clinical significant, clinically significant because you can have underdevelopment of the uncinate process and the osteomedial complex. So in a small percentage of patients, they can be predisposed to inflammatory sinus disease with narrowing of the uh, paranasal sinus drainage pathways. Now, one thing I want to talk about in terms of development is benign fatty lesion of the sphenoid. This was initially described as arrested pneumatization, but we're really trying to get that terminology uh, out of usage. So the preferred term is benign fatty lesion of the sphenoid. And what it looks like on imaging is you see this multifocal lucency, typically along the margins of an underdeveloped sphenoid sinus. And it's important because you do not want to mistake it for a fibrosseous or more aggressive skull-based lesion. And the way you distinguish it from a more aggressive lesion is it's going to have central fat attenuation on CT or central fat signal intensity on MRI. This is a normal finding. It's a normal variant. So the, its main importance is not to mistake it for a skull-based lesion. So now we'll look at anatomic variants associated with the osteomedial complex which is the primary drainage pathway for the maxillary, anterior ethmoid, and frontal sinuses. So the osteomedial complex consists of the maxillary antrum, the infundibulum, the hiatus semilunaris, and then that drains into the middle meatus, and it's bounded by the uncinate process, the middle turbinate, and then the medial, medial and inferior orbital wall. So a Haller cell is a very common variant, and this is an ethmoidal air cell that extends along the medial aspect of the orbital floor. In the vast majority of cases, this is just an incidental finding, but in some patients, you could get significant enough narrowing of the infundibulum that a small percentage of patients may be predisposed to underlying inflammatory sinus disease. In terms of the preoperative uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, CT, it's important to identify Haller cells because when the surgeon goes in to open up the osteomedial complex, they'll want to go ahead and take care of and resect that Haller cell. The next thing we'll talk about is paradoxical rotation of the turbinates. So under normal circumstances, both the inferior and middle turbinate rotate outwards. With paradoxical rotation, the middle turbinate rotates inwards. Just like a Haller cell, it's typically incidental and completely asymptomatic, but at times the paradoxical rotation can narrow that middle meatus, cause lateral displacement of the uh, uncinate process, and narrow the infundibulum like you can see on the right-hand side, 
where on the left hand side you do have that paradoxical rotation but you do not have associated narrowing of the middle meatus. Similarly, a concha bullosa can expand the middle turbinate to the point where you could have middle meatus narrowing. So a concha bullosa refers to when you have pneumatization of the middle turbinate. Most often it involves the bulbous segment as we see here and less commonly you have extension into the vertical lamellar segment. So again, just like paradoxical rotation, occasionally you can have some narrowing of the middle meatus, lateral deviation of the uncinate process, and narrowing of the infundibulum. But most often it's gonna be an incidental finding. Since it's a pneumatized or developed cavity, it can have associated inflammatory changes in the setting of sinus disease. And then lastly, what we'll talk about is the anode cell. So the anode cell is a variant posterior ethmoid air cell. And if there are a few things that you wanna take away from the lecture, this is definitely one of them that I hope you do because it's very important in the preoperative CT. So a nodi cell is identified as superior and lateral to the sphenoid. So this is a variant posterior ethmoid air cell that extends superior and lateral to the sphenoid sinus. And it's important because it often contains the optic nerve and there's an increased risk of optic nerve dehiscence and injury during functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So now we'll look at some pathologic developmental variants. And really what we're gonna look at is the nasal cavity. So we're gonna go from anterior to posterior. So the piriform aperture is the anterior bony inlet of the nasal cavity. And in a full term neonate, it normally measures 11 millimeters and greater in width, and it's stenotic if it's less than 11 millimeters. So patients present in one of two ways, either inability to pass a nasogastric tube, or with respiratory distress during feedings because during feedings, neonates become obligate nasal breathers. Most often it's gonna be sporadic, but it can be associated with syndromes. And occasionally you can have intracranial anomalies with the classic one being the holoprosencephaly. So the common findings that you see, in addition to the narrowing of the piriform aperture bony inlet, you see a triangular shaped hard palate like we have in this case, and occasionally you can see a solitary median maxillary central incisor. Now in the absence of a solitary median maxillary central incisor, this is an isolated anomaly in virtually all cases. When you have the solitary median maxillary central incisor, it's still most likely an isolated anomaly, but now you have an increased incidence of intracranial malformations or associations with syndrome. So in about 75% of the cases, you're gonna see this, but it's only a small percentage that are gonna have the intracranial abnormalities or syndromic associations. Mid-nasal stenosis is as we go back to the mid-nasal cavity is actually the least common congenital cause of uh, nasal stenosis. So what you're gonna see is narrowing of the mid-nasal cavity, but the anterior bony inlet or piriform aperture is gonna be widely patent, as is the posterior nasal cavity or coena. So here's an illustrative case where you have focal narrowing of the mid-nasal cavity. It characteristically will have this hourglass configuration as you have normal widening anterior and posterior, and then you have the narrowing within the mid-nasal cavity. Anteriorly, the piriform aperture is normal, and posteriorly, the coena or posterior nasal cavity is widely patent. And then lastly, coenal atresia. This is the most common cause of congenital nasal obstruction in the neonates. Most often it's bony with membranous being less common and most often it's gonna be unilateral. This is typically a sporadic malformation but it is associated with various uh, syndromes. Now bony coenal atresia is easy to identify because you can see the bony plate across the nasal cavity posteriorly where membranous can be a little bit more difficult so we wanna look for secondary findings. So what you're looking for is narrowing of the coena or posterior nasal cavity usually less than three and a half millimeters and it will be obstructed, so oftentimes you'll see opacification or debris layering within the nasal cavity. Some other secondary findings, you'll see inward bowing of the posterior medial maxilla, and then you could see thickening and lateral deviation of the bomer, which is the posterior portion of the nasal septum. So here's an example of bony atresia. So the left nasal cavity is normal, widely patent, nice and wide. On the right, you have the bony atresia, with some layering fluid and debris, as well as some layering fluid and debris within the right maxillary sinus. Now here's a case of membranous atresia. So again, on the left, the left is normal. You have a nice wide nasal cavity, including the posterior coena or nasal cavity. 
where you have asymmetric narrowing on the right. This actually measures less than three millimeters with opacification of the nasal cavity. You have a little bit of thickening and medial deviation of the posterior medial maxilla with a little bit of lateral deviation of the vomer or posterior portion of the nasal septum. So now we're going to look at the dominant paranasal signage uh, drainage pathways, and then we'll move on to uh, categorizing in uh, various types of inflammatory sinus disease. So the osteomedal complex is the primary drainage pathway for the maxillary, anterior ethmoid, and frontal sinuses. So the maxillary sinus is going to drain through the antrum into the infundibulum, anterior ethmoids into the infundibulum, the frontal sinus drains through the frontal recess and it either extends into the infundibulum or the middle meatus, depending upon the attachment site of the uncinate process. And all of the osteomedal complex drains into the middle meatus. And then the sphenoethmoidal recess drains the posterior ethmoids and the sphenoid sinuses. So again, going back to the osteomedal complex, maxillary antrum, infundibulum, hiatus semilunaris draining into the middle meatus, bordered by the uncinate process, middle turbinate, and then medial and inferior orbital walls. Now the frontal recess is identified on sagittal imaging. So what you wanna do is you wanna go off midline on either side on the sagittal images. And what you're looking for is the Agernazi cell. This is the most anterior ethmoid air cell, and this is one of the named frontal cells. There are many different frontal cell variants, but the Agernazi is gonna be the most common. Directly behind that is going to be the frontal recess. Some other landmarks on this image is you can see the basal lamella, and that separates the anterior from the posterior ethmoids. And then here's the sphenoid face, which separates the posterior ethmoids from the sphenoid sinus. So here's an illustrative case of isolated osteomedal complex disease, where we have complete opacification of the osteomedal complex with resultant maxillary, anterior ethmoid, and frontal sinus opacification. Now the sphenoethmoidal recess is best identified on axial images, and here you can see a patent sphenoethmoidal recess on the left, and that's gonna be the primary drainage pathway for the sphenoid and posterior ethmoid sinuses. And here's an example of sphenoethmoidal uh, recess disease. We have opacification of the sphenoethmoidal recess, moderate mucosal thickening of the left sphenoid sinus, and then we have some secondary signs of inflammation where you have abnormal bony sclerosis and thickening, which is compatible with osteitis, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So now we'll go over the different types of inflammatory sinus disease. Now the important thing, especially when we're talking about acute and chronic sinusitis, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is not an imaging diagnosis. There are certain findings on imaging that help support the clinical diagnosis, but this really is a clinical uh, diagnosis. So acute sinusitis, you have symptoms for less than four weeks duration. In the vast majority of cases, this is going to be viral and self-limited, and then a smaller percentage of cases are going to be bacterial, and patients present with nasal congestion, and often they're going to have headaches. Now this is treated medically, and imaging is not necessary for uncomplicated acute sinusitis. Imaging is really reserved for cases of recurrent refractory or chronic sinus disease, that need to undergo further evaluation, look for complications or preoperative planning. But in the setting of acute sinusitis, if they do imaging, some of the imaging findings that support the clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis are air fluid levels and frothy stranding or attenuation. So here's an example. This is a 25 year old woman with clinical signs and symptoms of acute sinusitis. And the imaging would support that diagnosis with bilateral air fluid levels and that's frothy or bubbly stranding within the sinuses themselves. That would help support the clinical diagnosis of acute sinusitis. Now again, chronic sinusitis is a clinical diagnosis because about 25% of completely asymptomatic patients will have what we would traditionally think of as findings of chronic sinusitis on CT, but they're asymptomatic. And if they don't have symptoms, then technically they do not have sinusitis by its strict definition. So in terms of chronic sinusitis, they have to have symptoms for more than three months. These are the cardinal signs and symptoms that the patient will either present with or they're gonna see on clinical examination. They need two of these plus one of the following findings, and this is where we come into play. Inflammation on imaging, that's mucosal thickening, typically greater than three millimeters, mucus retention cysts or osteitis, 
And then also occasionally we can see nasal polyps on imaging as well. So this is a 53-year-old gentleman who presented and was referred for clinical suspicion for chronic sinusitis, and the imaging findings would, would uh, support the clinical diagnosis of chronic sinusitis. Here you can see moderate left, mild right, maxillary sinus mucosal thickening with the associated polyp within the posterior nasal cavity on the right. And then this is a younger man with the clinical findings uh, and signs and symptoms of chronic sinusitis referred for imaging. Imaging would support that. We have a moderate sized mucus retention sift within the left maxillary sinus with a small amount of mild mucosal thickening along the floor of the right maxillary sinus. Now, osteitis is the one time on imaging where we can say that there are imaging findings of chronic inflammation, because when bone is chronically inflamed, it does what it likes to do, form new bone. And when it does that, you get abnormal sclerosis and bony thickening. So here you can see near complete opacification of the left sphenoid sinus with abnormal thickening and sclerosis of its walls compatible with osteitis. And that's the one imaging finding that has a much higher specificity that this is a, a chronic finding because you're starting to see those secondary bony changes. So now we'll move on to fungal sinusitis and we'll start off with allergic, which is more common. And this affects immunocompetent patients. It's more common in humid climates and it has an increased incidence in patients with asthma and multiple allergies. And it's caused by chronic recurrent infection with non-invasive fungi. So on imaging, what you're gonna see is complete paranasal sinus opacification with central increased attenuation, and often those sinuses are gonna be expanded. And if they're expanded significantly, they can have an associated facial deformity. Hypertelorism is actually really common. Now, oftentimes fungal secretions are gonna be hypo-intense on MRI, and occasionally they can actually mimic an aerated sinus. And the reason for that is a combination of fungal elements and heavy metals re results in that uh, decreased signal intensity on, on MR. If you give contrast, you're going to see peripheral mucosal enhancement, and that helps distinguish this from an underlying sinus mass. And even though it is non-invasive, you can get bony demineralization and extension into the orbit and intracranial compartments. So here's a characteristic example. This was a young adult man with allergic fungal sinusitis complete paranasal sinus opacification with central increased attenuation and significant paranasal sinus uh, expansion. Your medial orbital wall or lamina papricia normally would be sitting right here. So all of this is uh, sinus expansion and it's resulting in hypertelorism. Typically you should be able to fit one globe between the two globes. And here you can see these are significantly enlarged sinuses with the uh, hypertelorism. Now here's an example where the fungal elements can actually mimic an aerated sinus. So this is a 12 year old girl with allergic fungal sinusitis. These images were obtained on the same day. So if you go to the CT image, complete opacification of the paranasal sinuses, central increased attenuation, significant sinus expansion with associated hypertelorism. We went on to MR and all those areas of paranasal sinus opacification are so hypo intense on imaging that this easily could be mistaken for fully aerated sinuses because of those fungal elements and heavy metals that are associated with fungal sinus disease. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have invasive si uh, fungal sinusitis, and this is much more significant, and much more severe, and this typically affects immunosuppressed patients, and elderly diabetics are going to be uh, more susceptible than other patient populations, or at least very susceptible to invasive fungal sinusitis. So the most common is gonna be mucormycosis. Again, it likes to affect elderly diabetic patients. And this is gonna spread into the orbits and then it could spread intracranially into the cavernous sinus. And this really can be a life-threatening uh, infection. Aspergillus often occurs invasive aspergillus in immunosuppressed patients, but it can also affect immunocompetent patients. And aspergillus loves to involve the vasculature, so you can see vessel spasm, aneurysms, or even frank thrombosis. So what we're looking for on imaging in these immunosuppressed patients is more aggressive imaging features. So we're looking for soft tissue extension beyond the bony margins of the sinus with or without underlying aggressive bony destruction or bony erosion. And again, like we talked about, a lot of times focal fungal elements will be hypo-intense on MRI. So here is an, this is an adult man immunosuppressed with uh, mucormycosis, 
And here we can see abnormal enhancement throughout the paranasal sinuses, focal area of decreased signal intensity within the right sphenoid sinus, significant extension into the orbits with associated proptosis, as well as extension into the suprazygomatic uh, 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 masticator space. And then you have intracranial extension with abnormal dural enhancement extending to the cavernous sinus. And then this is an eight-year-old girl with aplastic anemia and has invasive aspergillosis uh, sinusitis on biopsy. Here we can see uh, near complete opacification of the right maxillary sinus, opacification throughout the nasal cavity with erosion of the nasal septum. And then this is the subtle finding that we're looking for, not subtle in this case, but subtle in other cases you want to look for is extension of abnormal soft tissue induration beyond the bony margins of the sinus. And then you can also see subtle extension into the terrible palatine fossa uh, as well. That's where you wanna raise your suspicion that this is invasive, it's getting beyond the bony margins of the sinus. Same patient on MRI. Again, portions of that fungal colonization are gonna be hypo-intense, not quite mimicking a sinus like we saw in that allergic fungal sinusitis case significant expansion into the orbit, as well as abnormal enhancement extending into the cavernous sinus with some very subtle narrowing of the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery on the right compared to the left. Now, we talked about the anode cell, which is one of the things I would hope that you would take away from this. Odontogenic sinusitis is the other one. This is a really important uh, entity that, I, that is often uh, uh, mistaken or at least missed when it's first imaged. So this is maxillary sinusitis that's actually the result of odontogenic or underlying periodontal disease, and it represents about 10% of cases of recurrent refractory maxillary sinusitis. And the reason it's refractory to medical therapy is typical uncomplicated sinus disease. The antibiotics cover aerobic organisms because it's typically an aerobic infection. But when you have odontogenic sinusitis, it's mixed. It has anaerobic and aerobic organisms, so you don't have the adequate coverage. So really the treatment is more broad spectrum antibiotics. And then you also have to treat the underlying periodontal or odontogenic disease. So sometimes antibiotics will take care of that, but oftentimes you might need tooth extraction or repair of an oral antral fistula if that's present. So this is really a diagnosis that needs to be made on CT. And what you're looking for is a periapical lucency with overlying maxillary sinus disease. Now, you may have bony demineralization, you may have frank dehiscence, but not all the time, but that's what you're looking for. So here's an illustrative case. This was actually the third CT this patient had gotten for sinus disease. And the first two times the finding wasn't identified or at least as the causative etiology. So here you have complete opacification of the maxillary sinus extending through and expanding the maxillary antrum into the nasal cavity. We have findings like we talked about of chronic inflammation with osteitis of the walls. And this was the finding that was initially overlooked twice, this large periapical lucency involving a right maxillary molar with an area of frank bony dehiscence. There's direct communication between this periodontal disease and the overlying maxillary uh, sinus. On sagittal imaging, again, you could see two of the maxillary molars have prominent periapical lucencies and one of them actually has frank bony dehiscence. So this patient actually needs to be treated by an oral surgeon. They do not need functional endoscopic sinus surgery at this point. So now we'll look at complications of inflammatory sinus disease before we wrap things up with uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery and the preoperative sinus CT. So the first one we'll talk about an anterocolenal polyp. So an anterocolenal polyp refers to a polyp that originates in the maxillary sinus. It fills the maxillary sinus extends through and expands the maxillary antrum, and then it herniates into the nasal cavity. So patients present with ipsilateral nasal obstruction. So on CT, what you're looking for is maxillary sinus opacification with a lobular component going through the antrum and extending into the nasal cavity. Now sometimes, depending on how far back that polypoid uh, lesion extends into the nasal cavity, the stalk that connects those two can be very subtle, so you want to look closely for it. So here's a characteristic example, complete opacification of the maxillary sinus, extends through an expanded maxillary antrum with a polypoid ponent extending posteriorly into the nasal cavity. And then the patient incidentally also has a mucus retention cyst in the right maxillary sinus. 
But this is a very characteristic appearance for an anthrocoinal polyp. The next one is a mucosyl. So mucosyl is a slow-growing cystic lesion that's caused by uh, chronic outlet obstruction of the sinus. Most often it involves just one sinus, but occasionally it can extend into an adjacent sinus. Most common sinuses, frontal, followed by ethmoid, followed by sphenoid, and it's uh, relatively uncommon in the maxillary sinus. Since this is a chronic process, you're gonna see inspissated or proteinaceous secretions on both CT and MRI, and you can have areas of bony demineralization and dehiscence, so you can get extension into the orbits and intracranial. Now, oftentimes the, the extension is benign unless it's super infected and you get a pyomucosyl, and then at that point you could see significant inflammatory changes associated with it. But this is a nice illustrative case of a frontal sinus mucosyl on CT, complete opacification of the frontal sinus. On the left, you see significant expansion. You have overlying bony demineralization and then frank bony dehiscence. It follows mostly fluid signal intensity on MRI, but then you do have areas of inspissated or proteinaceous secretions. And there's flattening of the frontal lobe, but there's no inflammatory response because this is a chronic indolent process. If it becomes super infected with a pyomucosyl, then you can see a lot of inflammatory changes associated with it. Next, we'll talk about POTS puffy tumor, which is very common in the pediatric and adolescent population. And this is where you get a subperiosteal abscess of the frontal bone. So patients present with prefrontal soft tissue induration and edema. So the POTS puffy tumor is what the clinicians see. They see the swelling over the forehead, and then we do the imaging to look for the underlying cause. So this occurs in children and adolescents because their venous structures allows for transvenous spread of sinus disease into the prefrontal soft tissues. And then most importantly, what we need to worry about is, is there intracranial extension? So the treatment is gonna be antibiotics and then surgical drainage of any localized uh, collections or abscesses. So here's an illustrative case of an adolescent that presented with fever, headache, and progressive facial swelling. And then here you can see the significant induration of the prefrontal soft tissues with a focal superficial abscess. And then more importantly, you have abnormal underlying dural enhancement, an epidural abscess, a subdural empyema, and then abnormal underlying leptomeningeal enhancement. So they have pachymeningitis, leptomeningitis, epidural abscess, and subdural empyema. And on CT, you could see the irregularity and frank dehiscence of the underlying frontal bone Oftentimes, these are going to be associated with a frontal osteomyelitis. So now moving on, we'll talk about post-septal orbital cellulitis. And in this case, we're really talking about a spread of a paranasal sinus disease, not a preceptal process that then extends uh, post-septal. So when we're talking about inflammatory sinus disease, typically this is a direct spread from an underlying ethmoid sinus disease. So on imaging, you'll see opathic opacification of the ethmoid sinus you'll see some overlying bony demineralization of the lamina papricia. And then when you get a subperiosteal abscess, you're actually gonna see a hypodense collection with surrounding inflammatory changes. And because of the increase in the intraorbital pressure with a space occupying abscess, patients will present with proptosis. This needs to be treated pretty urgently because you don't want it to progress to visual loss or even intracranial spread. So here's an example case of an adolescent that had a congestion and then presented with acute onset of visual impairment. And here we can see opacification of the sphenoid and left ethmoid sinuses. You have bony demineralization of the lamina papricia. Here is your uh, subperiosteal abscess, surrounding inflammatory changes, lateral deviation and thickening of the medial rectus muscle and associated proptosis. Now, cavernous sinus thrombosis is a very rare but very serious complication of either paranasal sinus or orbital infections that spread intracranially. And the reason they spread to the cavernous sinus is that's the dr primary drainage pathway for the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. So with cavernous sinus thrombosis, what you're gonna see is expansion of the cavernous sinus like we see here. On MRI, you'll see abnormal signal and loss of flow voids and then on both CT and MRI, you're going to see patchy areas of non-enhancement, and those are the areas of thrombosis within the cavernous sinus itself. Now, when you get cavernous sinus thrombosis, 
you start to get congestion of all the drainage areas that that supplies. So patients will present with progressive orbital and facial edema. And the treatment is really antibiotics towards the infectious process as well as anticoagulation. So here's that same patient. Marked paranasal sinus disease involving the sphenoid and ethmoid sinuses. You have some abnormal inflammation in the left orbit, significantly more inflammatory stranding and enhancement within the right orbit, even going along the optic nerve sheath complex, extending into the preceptal soft tissues. You have bilateral abnormal dural enhancement extending into the cavernous sinus, which is expanded, and then multifocal areas of non-enhancement within the cavernous sinus. So this is a really characteristic example of the dreaded complication of cavernous sinus thrombosis that all began with paranasal sinus disease, then it had intraorbital and then intracranial spread. And then lastly, silent sinus syndrome. So this is where you have atelectasis or collapse of an opacified maxillary sinus. So this is thought to result from chronic obstruction leads to negative pressure within the maxillary sinus. So you get inward collapse of the walls of the sinus. Most importantly, you get inferior displacement of the orbital floor. And then you can also see lateral deviation of the medial orbital wall in the uncinate process. Now, when you have inferior displacement of the floor of the orbit, Patients can present with an ophthalmus because you're increasing the intraorbital volume, so the globe actually extends posteriorly. And then typically patients will actually present with acute onset of a facial deformity where they'll actually get a sunken deformity overlying the sinus that has collapsed. Since it's a chronic process, you're going to see the inspissated or protonaceous secretions. And sometimes it can be very difficult or even impossible to differentiate from a completely opacified hypoplastic sinus, which is far more common. So again, it's that facial deformity and you're really looking at the, flo the orbital floor, the contour and location to determine whether it's silent sinus syndrome or it's just an opacified hypoplastic sinus. So here's an example case. This was a young adult man who had sinus congestion, a headache, and then had acute onset of a new facial deformity. And here you can see complete opacification of the maxillary sinus you have inferior displacement and abnormal rounded contour of the orbital floor compared to the normal location and slope that you see on the contralateral side. Here's another patient on MRI. Again, complete opacification of the maxillary sinus. There are some areas of inspissated secretions or protonaceous content. Inferior displacement and abnormal contour of the orbital floor compared to the normal location and the normal slope on the normal side. Now, in this case, you also have lateral deviation of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus, and now the uncinate process is actually abutted up against the orbital floor. So this is now a, a completely isolated sinus. It has no drainage pathway because the uncinate process is abutting the orbital wall. So there's nowhere for this uh, debris and secretions to actually drain from that maxillary sinus. Now we'll wrap up talking about the functional endoscopic uh, sinus surgery and specifically the preoperative sinus CT. So functional endoscopic sinus surgery is the primary surgical treatment for chronic medically resistant sinusitis. And really what they're doing is they're trying to open the normal drainage pathways. So they're going after the osteomedial complex and the frontal recess to try to open those up to allow the drainage pathways to uh, be restored. And functional endoscopic sinus surgery results in sustained clinical improvement in about 50 to 75% of cases. And since it's a relatively safe procedure and these patients are often miserable, 50 to 75% is actually a pretty good success rate. Again, because it is a low risk procedure, but it's a low risk if we do due, due diligence, we actually keep the surgeon out of trouble by uh, identifying some uh, critical variants. So here's your typical anatomy, your normal anatomy, focusing on the osteomedial complex. So here's a patient that has undergone a medial antrostomy, uncinectomy, partial termidectomy, and then partial ethmoidectomy. Getting a little bit more extensive, this patient had further terminectomy and now a total ethmoidectomy. And then this is the most extensive where they actually go all the way up into the frontal sinuses, and that's a frontal drill out procedure. So the preoperative CT is really the gold standard prior to uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery. And really there's a couple of things we wanna do. 
you know, you definitely want to go ahead and describe the pattern of paranasal sinus disease, but really you want to identify the variants that we talked about around that osteomatal complex, which are going to impact the surgical access to the osteomatal complex and determine what type of resection they need to do. But most importantly, it allows us to review the danger areas for potential ser serious complications to help keep the surgeon and more importantly, the patient out of trouble. So again, Functional endoscopic sinus surgery is focusing on the osteomedial complex and the frontal recess. Here's the maxillary antrum, infundibulum, hiatus semilunaris down into the middle meatus, bounded by the uncinate process, middle turbinate, medial inferior orbital walls. And then again, off midline sagittal view, find that agar nausea, and there's your frontal recess right behind it. So when it comes to the danger spots, a, a useful mnemonic that you can use is the close mnemonic, C-L-O-S-E. And each one identifies a, a significant area that you want to evaluate to look for anatomic variations that predispose the patient to significant surgical complications. In a preoperative sinus CT, I include the close mnemonic at the end of every single report. So the C refers to the cribriform plate. So the cribriform plate consists of the lamina cribrosa, the vertical lateral lamella, and then the fovea ethmoidalis, which we already talked about, which is the roof of the ethmoid sinus. And these bony margins will separate the olfactory fossa. So the Kiro scale measures the depth of that olfactory fossa superiorly from the fovea ethmoidalis, inferiorly down to the lamina cribrosa, and then the lateral margin is the lateral boundary of that uh, olfactory fossa. So there are three grades of the Kiros grading. Zero to three millimeters depth is grade one, four to seven is grade two, and then greater than seven is a grade three. Now grade three is important because as you increase the depth of the olfactory fossa, you increase the length of that lateral lamella. The lateral lamella is the weakest part of the cribriform plate. And when you injure the lateral lamella, you get a CSF leak, which is the most common serious complication associated with functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Now the lateral lamella can be injured in one of two ways, either during an ethmoidectomy, if the surgeon inadvertently penetrates or injures the lateral lamella, or more commonly, at least nowadays, during a turbinectomy. So the middle turbinate attaches at the junction of the lateral lamella and the lamina cribrosa. So if they over manipulate this, they can get a fracture right at its attachment site, which can cause injury to the lateral lamella and a CSF leak. The other thing you wanna look for is asymmetry in the Kiros. So asymmetry is gonna affect surgical planning. So if you have different depths of the olfactory fossa, then the surgeon needs to know that they must appropriate plan for either side or both sides. So here's an example where you have an asymmetric Kiros. The endoscope on this side, if you did the planning on the left, is safe. But if you use the same planning model on the left for the right, you're not safe because you may inadvertently penetrate through the lateral lamella. So the lateral lamella that's more inferiorly positioned is more at risk when you have an asymmetric Kiros. So you definitely at least want to identify whether they have a Kiros type 3 or whether they're asymmetric before they go in for surgery. The L is easy. That's the lamina papricia or the medial orbital wall. So really what you're looking for, a remote orbital wall fracture with herniation of orbital contents and displacement of the lamina papricia into the ethmoid sinus. And the reason this is important is if the surgeon is in there doing an ethmoidectomy and they mistake this displaced lamina papricia for an ethmoid sinus septation, if they transect that, you now have direct communication with a presumed infected sinus and the orbit. And more importantly, if the medial rectus muscle extends into that defect, they can injure the medial rectus muscle, which is essentially irreparable damage to the uh, medial rectus. The O we've talked about, the anode cell. So just remember, whenever you see the sphenoid sinus, and just remember the floor of the sphenoid sinus is the roof of the nasal, uh, nasal pharynx, so here's the bony roof, just look up. If you look up and you see a pneumatized cell, it's one of two things. It's either a septation within the sphenoid sinus, which is normal, or it's an anode cell. 
and remember the nodi cell is the posterior ethmoid air cell that extends above and lateral to the sphenoid. And this is really important because it typically contains the optic nerve and it increases the risk of dehiscence and injury to that optic nerve during functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So the S is the sphenoid. There are a few things we need to talk about in terms of the sphenoid. First one is the pattern of pneumatization and really the important one is the cella. So there are three different variants. The conchal is where you have relative under pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. So you have a nice thick bony plate between the sphenoid sinus and the cella. The precellar variant is where pneumatization extends to the anterior margin of the cella. And then the cellar variant is where you get excessive pneumatization that goes inferior and posterior to the cella and that results in a very thin clivus as the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. So the reason this is important is you got to remember that the patient is supine during surgery. So if they're actually going to enter into the sphenoid sinus, the surgeon needs to know if there's a cellar variant because they need to maintain strict discipline control of their surgical instrumentation. Because if they lose control of that endoscope, they can easily penetrate through that very thin wall of the uh, uh, clivus. The other thing that we want to look for is the uh, carotid artery, the uh, cavernous segment of the carotid as it extends along the region of the sinus. And I think this is one area where we do a really good job. In residency, they really harp on look at the carotid canal and look for dehiscence. So here's a normal protected carotid where you have a nice bony covering over the cavernous segments of the carotid canal where here's an example where you have dehiscence, where that actual carotid artery is free within the uh, sphenoid sinus, or it has a free edge within the sphenoid sinus. Here's another example, where because of the excessive pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, you have uncovering of the carotid canals, complete dehiscence on the right, and just a thin bony covering on the left. The other thing you want to look for is this is a sphenoid sinus septation separating the left from the right, if that attaches onto a thin bony canal of the carotid, you want to mention that too, because if they over manipulate that septation, that can cause an injury too. Similar to what we were talking about with a turbinectomy manipulation with injury to the lateral lamella. And then lastly, very similar to a nodi cell, like we talked about in the beginning when we were talking about excessive or extensive pneumatization. If you get extensive pneumatization of a normal sphenoid sinus into the anterior clinoid, that in and of itself can uncover the optic nerve uh, like you see here. And the reason this is important is if the surgeon is in the sphenoid sinus and that optic nerve is uncovered or has no bony covering, the surgeon really can't see it because everything has a thin mucosal surface. So the only thing they might be able to see is a small bulge. But other than that, if they start stripping away that mucosa, they could easily inadvertently injure that optic nerve with, with irreparable visual damage. So you really want to make sure you look for this. And then lastly, we talked about the anodi cell being important, the dontogenic sinusitis. This is the third point that I really hope you take home because this is the most common critical variant that is missed in a preoperative CT report. And this is the ethmoidal artery, the, specifically the anterior ethmoidal artery. So the anterior ethmoidal artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery, and it passes through the fovea ethmoidalis to enter the ethmoid sinus. And the way you could find its entry site is you want to look for the ethmoid notch. So here is the anterior ethmoidal notch. It's this little triangular thing, and you'll be able to see it on virtually every single sinus CT or head CT if you do coronal image. Just get in the practice of looking for it. This is where the anterior ethmoidal artery is going to enter the sinus cavity. Now, if the ethmoidal notch abuts the fovea ethmoidalis, it's considered protected. However, if you get pneumatization of ethmoid air cells above this, then it's at risk of injury during functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So here's an example. Ethmoidal notch abuts the fovea ethmoidalis. This artery is protected. It has a very low risk of injury during functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Here's your ethmoidal notch. This is the supraorbital pneumatization above the ethmoidal notch. That artery is now hanging on a pedicle within the sinus. If the surgeon is doing an ethmoidectomy, inadvertently transects that article on a pedicle, you're going to get a retracted artery and you're going to get an uncontrolled arterial retraorbital hematoma. 
So definitely look for the supraorbital pneumatization. The surgeon needs to know about it so they could do their planning so that they don't extend superior to this region. So just in summary, in terms of the close mnemonic, using that at the end of your uh, reports, for the cribriform plate, identify the Kiros. You're looking for Kiros 3, which is greater than 7 millimeters olfactory fossa depth or asymmetry. L is the lamina papricia. You're looking for that remote orbital uh, wall fracture. Onodi cell, identify it, and then look to see if you have optic nerve dehiscence. Sphenoid sinus, for the pneumatization, we're looking for that cellar variant, which is that excessive pneumatization that goes inferior and posterior to the cella. Look for both carotid and optic nerve dehiscence. And then lastly, the ethmoidal artery, you're looking for supraorbital pneumatization of the ethmoids above that ethmoidal notch. So in summary, what I wanted to do was talk about some normal development, normal sinus anatomy, go over some normal developmental as well as pathologic developmental variants, look at the primary drainage pathways for the paranasal sinuses, talk about the different types of sinus disease, really focusing on acute versus chronic and knowing that it's really a clinical diagnosis and the imaging findings are to help support that diagnosis. CT is really useful for looking for chronic sinusitis, looking for complications and uh, surgical planning purposes for the functional endoscopic sinus surgery. And when you're reviewing those preoperative CTs, just make sure in some way you look at those elements. I use the close mnemonic. It really doesn't matter what you use as long as somehow you capture those elements, especially the anodi cell and the uh, superorbital pneumatization because those are very commonly missed and they're very important to help the surgeon uh, keep them out of trouble. Here are some references if you want to have some further uh, readings. I'm also more than happy uh, to share these slides. You, know, you, you can have them, use them for educational pur purposes, refer back to it if you like, I have no problem with that at all. And with that, I really thank you for the time. It's, it's really an honor to be including this I and mean, help for the world does a tremendous job. And I'm just uh, a very thrilled part of it. With that, if you have any questions, I'd like to be able to answer them if I can, uh, but that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank you so much.